Back with Matt here on Cape Radio HD. I'm uh, privileged to have Enrique from the best days and parliamentary seat holder for Stellenbosch. Welcome. Good day. So, um, we've just got a, a few questions from, from some of our uh, learners here in Stellenbosch, and uh, I think we're going to go through about seven questions with you. Just a quick, quick overview of, of certain things, current issues happening in, uh, in and around the government and also the DA, and just a few slight questions, that's all. So, what does it mean to be a parliamentary seat holder? Well, it's a, it's a great privilege to uh, be able to serve as a public representative in Parliament. Basically, you obviously represent uh, the interests of a number of voters, mm -hmm. although not only those that voted for you, but also the wider community once you're allocated to a specific constituency. I have been allocated to the Stavros constituency, which is just great because uh, uh, Parliament is within easy reach of here. My colleagues up north obviously spend a lot of time in the aeroplanes. Yeah, uh, flying them down. Then secondly, uh, I also served then on the Portfolio Committee for Higher Education and Training, okay. which suits me quite well. Obviously there you have an oversight function over the various uh, universities, but basically the Department of Higher Education and Training, making sure that they spend taxpayers' money in the best way possible. And then also there's the legislative duties where one must consider legislation, how can we improve things in South Africa, because you find that people eventually have to play according to the rules. Okay. And, and it's almost as if you're writing the rule book yeah. for South Africans. Okay. Well, seeing that we're talking about rules, um, the last big parliamentary meeting was obviously the vote of no confidence. So another query, really good question is, is Zuma the symptom or cause of corruption? I think it's a symptom. Uh, the causes of corruption are widespread and I think one of the main causes is the, is the notion that you know the previous government stole and therefore it's now our turn to steal. Yes. Uh, there's even a book out with the title, it's our time to eat. Okay. Um, so, so once we break that mold or that thinking to say that listen it's not, it's not about you know it's your turn now to do what is wrong, yeah. to enrich yourselves, then I think uh, you know corruption can be curbed. Uh, but definitely, Zuma is only but one uh, symptom of, of, of a widespread corruption. And corruption is also not uh, limited to the public sector. Okay. The problem, to a large extent, is the interface between public and private. Okay. And the fact that many people believe that they need to be corrupt in order to get service delivery. From, from government to gain benefit from it. That's right. Okay. That's right. All right. Um, so, what's the DA's vision in the future, or, or you know, the next coming years, yes. in especially in the Western Cape region, and and obviously Gauteng now as well. That's right. Now, obviously, our vision is to become uh, the government yep. of South Africa. It's still a way off, uh, but we believe that we need in South Africa a government that will be free, fair, that will particularly uh, opening up opportunities for people to improve their lives okay. themselves. Uh, we do not believe in a nanny state. Okay. We do believe in, in uh, giving people a hand up yep. rather than a hand out. Okay. And uh, there are so many hardworking South Africans and talented South Africans that unfortunately are being denied the opportunity just to, to break self, out of that. Self-improvement and, right. and just to get up to that's right. the, the next level. level. Yeah. That's right. Fantastic. And, we, and, and that is how we try to also frame our policies okay. to, to, to open up those opportunities for, for people. In, in which way? Could you give me an example in, in well, which way the DA is 
helping those underprivileged yeah, uh, persons? For example, uh, our education system. Okay. Uh, at this point in time, unfortunately, many of our schools are so dysfunctional that the pupils that attend those schools just don't have any chance of getting access to higher education, post school training, etc. So one of our focus areas would definitely be to try and fix the education system and to try and break the, the hold that some trade unions currently have, which pre prevents education departments, school principals, etc. To, to, to act against those delinquent teachers uh, and, and, and so that really merit will always you know, be the one factor that will determine whether you can stay in the education system, mm -hmm. whether you qualify for promotion, and that, so that we can have good educational leadership in, in our schools. That's just one, one option. There are numerous others. Obviously, we also believe uh, that once you're in a job, opening up training opportunities for you there is, is extremely important. Yeah. And there is currently this CETA system, the Sectoral Education and Training Authorities. Okay. But, uh, we believe that that system should be revamped because those that should be benefiting are not currently not benefiting. benefiting. Do you think it's an old school method that they are using, a methodology, and that they need to renew some of their, their teaching methods? For methods example, yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, many of the young people that leave school because of personal circumstances mm -hmm. or because of circumstances even at school that force them out, they do not get an opportunity again in life to learn to qualify and to be able to undertake more creative and new ventures, etc. And at this point in time, our public education sector, particularly our colleges, uh, they do, do not invest in, for example, online learning, etc. Okay. And we believe that technology has opened up numerous opportunities. Great, uh... And technology is, 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 is now becoming more and more available to even the poorest of the kids. And uh, the fact that, unfortunately, from the higher education department, there's just no initiative in that regard. Okay. We believe we see this grace. Okay. And the syllabi that often date from the 1980s still should really be reviewed and revamped as quickly as possible. So we, we believe that there are numerous opportunities to make a mass, or to achieve mass access to training by technology, even for people in remote. And especially there is uh, free Wi-Fi, free data in, in, right. in you know those communities. That's right. I think Stellenbosch has rolled out with the Stellenbosch has been one of the, the Isabella, if I'm not mistaken, the Isabella Wi-Fi stations in and around Stellenbosch have noticed the range. That's right. Stellenbosch has been the pioneer, uh, and we're quite proud of the B8 uh, council mm -hmm. previous term that uh, started with this. And my impression is that many of the young people are already using this. Okay, fantastic. So, um, on to education. Fees must fall. Yes. What is your opinion on that? Firstly, we, there's no doubt in our mind that the university fees are just far too high. College fees are just far too high. Okay. Um, unfortunately, government subsidies of those institutions have not kept up with the inflation, particularly the, the, the rising costs for those high education institutions. So what we've seen over the last probably 20 years is that universities, colleges have to put up their fees year on year by one, two, three, even four, five percentage points higher than the inflation rate. So it's become more and more difficult even for your middle income families to be able to send children to, to university. So, so that needs to be addressed by a reprioritization. Okay. And we have in our alternative budget proposal in the National Assembly also shown to the government where we believe the necessary cuts could be made and uh, where by uh, post-school training could be better funded. Mm -hmm. The next thing is that we do not believe in fee-free education. No. There are still a number of families that can afford to send their children to university and uh, they must still pay okay. uh, because it's an investment in their own Children, yes. it's an investment in their own families for the future. So those that can afford to pay, they must pay. They should pay. But then lastly, before we, we move on, I just want to say, we also have this policy that no meritorious uh, child 
no one with the necessary ability and potential to make a success of post-school study should be denied that opportunity okay. because of their financial circumstances. Okay. And in that respect, we really believe that A, the, the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, perhaps under a new name and far better administration, should be uh, maintained, mm -hmm. should even be improved. And then we should also have an upper sliding scale for those families that earn more than 122,000 rand per annum, okay. which is currently the cutoff to, to, to uh, qualify for, a for this fast student aid. Okay. We believe that you know if your family is currently having a, a, a annual income of 150,000 rand, mm -hmm. it will be still impossible for that family to send the, uh, their children to university, and we need to address that missing middle ground. Okay. The missing link. Yes, sir. the missing middle. Yeah, the, the missing middle. Um, another thing is uh, young entrepreneurs. Yes. I know that uh, I've, I've realized, I've, well, I've noticed, I'm not sure how long it's been running for, I need to look into it, is that uh, Stellenbosch is offering young entrepreneur courses for a year. Yes. So do you think that's obviously building our economy, also job creation, where you, you're kind of creating your own, right. your own lifestyle, your own job opportunities yes. by becoming a young entrepreneur? That's right. Uh, we obviously know that it's in small business where you have labor intensive economic growth. Okay. But what people often, to my mind, forget is you can't just train somebody to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. People need specific skills which will make them highly sought after, and then they can choose to start their own in business the, in their own and, direction. and become an entrepreneur. Okay. You can't just take a, a matriculant with general, you know, academic school background mm -hmm. and turn that person into an entrepreneur. Um, what studies have found is that quite often entrepreneurs set up their first businesses whilst they're in their 30s, early 40s. Once they've got these scarce skills Life lessons. and they know the, the environment mm -hmm. in which they would like to go, whether it's, let's say, the hospitality industry, whether it's the building industry, you, you need some background, you need networks, you need contacts, and you need inside knowledge of that sector. And that is why we believe, uh, yes, entrepreneurial training is important, but entrepreneurial training, we must know that that will be a post-school, and even while you're uh, uh, in a job, that you will have that, uh, offer that training after hours, so that people that are unhappy in their current circumstances or that feel that they can't break out of the mold, mm -hmm. sometimes people even feel exploited by the employers, say, okay, but here now we've got the tools, let's go and see if you can make a success. There's a skill or a trade and so on. Right. Fantastic. Water crisis, that's, mm -hmm. that's a big one in the Western Cape. Yes. What is the local government here doing about the water crisis? What is the the next step in, right. in, in water saving and, and what's happening. We're running out of water, there's nothing we can, we can't, unfortunately, we can't change the climate that we have manipulated as such. This yes. is what I believe, I think, you know, it's greenhouse gases and so on and so on. So what is the next step? There are a few options and uh, th there's not a single solution to something like the current drought. Yeah. And I think the first one is obviously we must uh, ensure that the, the little water we have, that we make the most of that. Okay. Uh, I myself am showering currently in a, in a crate, which I especially went to buy so that the sides are not too high, and then I flush my toilet with that. Okay. Um, so we must, and, and if I want hot water from my tap, the first three liters or so that come, that's cold, obviously that goes to, into a separate container also to be reused, etc. So we will have to look at at uh, you know what we use the water for okay. and how we can really uh, try and stress the water that we have available. Uh, the second thing is uh, I think we would have to just accept that the way in which we've been gardening up to now is uh, needs to change. Needs to change. Okay. We need to be water wise in terms of our gardens, um, and I think we've already learned last year when we were prohibited. You know, from irrigating through mm -hmm. with automatic sprinkler systems and all those things, what plants can survive and, and what need extra attention. Then, from the municipality side, obviously they need to uh, fast track the, 
replacement of old water pipes. Okay. Uh, we are already in the Western Cape, uh, fairly well off in terms of, of our infrastructure. Okay. But because water pipes are underground and they're often not seen, uh, we don't realize that about 15% of our water, and in some municipalities with even more uh, aging uh, infrastructure, the figure is much higher, that we are losing you know, uh, quite easily 15% of our, of our water. Water through loss. And then lastly, I think uh, we will have to look at uh, rainwater harvesting at a small scale, almost like the, the trend where people turn to solar panels and so on with the <laughs> electricity crisis. I think although it's not at this point in time, doesn't make economic sense mm -hmm. uh, because the infrastructure of a water tank, etc., you know, is still more expensive. It's expen to get a bio Jojo tank and all that is quite expensive. Yeah. But I think we, 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 we need to go that way, okay. not only from an economic point of view, but also from an environmental sensitive point of view, where people say, I'm, I want to live responsibly and therefore I will, uh, you know, use where I can. For example, for those few plants that I still want to, or those few uh, toilets that I need to flush, flush etc., yeah. that can be done with, with the rainwater, locally harvested, and um, I'm actually looking forward to, to seeing how many times in a year can you refill those tanks okay. and what the actual cost would, would be. Okay. But I think there's a lot that we can do. Uh, the, the main thing is we must just realize that it is uh, an emergency situation that we are currently facing in the Western Cape. And it can change tomorrow. I do still hope that it will change. We all hope I remember it there are some August months where I had to start irrigating you know, my garden. Fortunately now we've had little, little rain. Mm -hmm. What we actually need is obviously almost like a small flood to be able to fill our dams. Okay. Our, our farmers look, you know, the, the, I've been traveling in the Swatland, which is known for its grain, its wheat, etc. It looks good at this point in time, okay. but, but the water uh, is not running off to the dams. dams yeah. And that is our biggest I think cost. we're looking at 33% in our dams at the moment, currently. 33 of which something like 33% is usable, yes. What yes. happens when you run out of water? What is the... Uh... Well, obviously one is able to predict. Yeah. That, uh, and, and it is not as if we will suddenly one day just, just run out, out yeah. see there's no, no water. Okay. But I do believe that uh, in the case of Stonewash, we are already looking at some more boreholes. Okay. In the city of Cape Town, they are also looking at things like a desalination plant, etc., which a few months ago, you know, would have been like number seven on the list of yeah. what we should be looking it's at. Now sitting at now it's sitting one at, the right, right at the top or very close to the top. So that is that. Those are all possibilities. Was this not foreseen um, a few years back already? It's very difficult to, to foresee the to extent foresee of a drought. Out. We know you will. Have, you know you will have some dry seasons. Yeah. You will have some wet seasons. Uh, a few years back, when they expected the Berg River Dam to only fill up over the course of three winters, mm -hmm. it only took one good rainy season, and the dam was oh, overflowing. Okay. So it's it's really it's really. Uh, almost impossible to predict long-term weather trends, particularly these, these droughts, etc. Okay. And then uh, one can say, yes, we should have invested more in more dams, more infrastructure, etc. But we must also understand in this country, you know, you must decide where are you going to spend your scarce resources, yeah. taxpayers' money. We can build dams that will ensure that we will never run out of water in, in the Western Cape, in the foreseeable future, or we can spend that money on things like housing, education, uh, road infrastructure, etc. These okay. are all, all important. They're all important, yes. So, so I uh, believe that you, know, you must manage this situation now, and hopefully in a year or so from now we will know that uh, you know, the crisis is over, we've had the rains that we needed in the Western Cape, and that we can again rather spend money on things such as I've said, the houses, houses mm -hmm. etc., um, than, than, than to have infrastructure being there and it's being underutilized. Okay. Uh, 
it's like in, in insurance. Yeah. It's always a bit difficult call. Shall I take up insurance or shall I run the risk? Especially when you're working on a tight budget. That's that's, right. that's which, which currently is the case in, in government. All government departments are running at an extremely tight budget. So money, there, there is not money to waste. Okay. Um, another question is Claymont Housing Project. And the uh, rights that you've And the rights you've yes. yes. It's a, it's a an interesting phenomena that we uh, are seeing in South Africa that communities uh, feel that just because of uh, uh, the way you're located should determine your economic opportunities and others that are not in that same location should be denied those, those opportunities. Firstly, I think it's a symptom of the absolute dire poverty situation that we have, the desperation amongst many people to just find an income. And cleaning projects are not high income projects. You know, people are often being paid the minimum wages, etc. And despite that, even that is far better than having nothing. Nothing, yes. The second thing is, uh, in, the, in the case specifically of, of Claremont, what we find is obviously price is still your biggest uh, deciding factor in whether a tender is uh, allocated to you or not. And these bid committees, they sit, their, their books are open, they're transparent, and there's no doubt in my mind that whoever sat there allocated the bid to the bidder with the lowest uh, t tender, okay. or as we also say, the highest points. Because we do, in the South African situation, we do also provide for example, for cases where uh, people come from disadvantaged backgrounds, where we know that we cannot just keep on supporting the, the, the advantaged, yes. but we also need to look at small entrepreneurs, emerging businesses, etc. Et Trade skills and That's teaching right. skills. And, all. and uh, the other thing is obviously within a municipality, we cannot say that because it's a, it's a cleaning project in a, a neighborhood like Brandwald, mm -hmm. only the Brandwald people can, you know, should benefit, from, it, yeah. should benefit from the employment opportunities, okay. etc. If we go down that road, I think we will be going exactly in the opposite direction of where we want to, to, to go. go. And again, we must get, as, as a responsible local government, the Overstrand municipality had to get the best value for money okay. with the facts that were presented to them at, at that time. Uh, they are apparently meeting with the community and hopefully once the community has been served with the answers, uh, the unrest will die down and hopefully it, be, it will just make sense, I think, from that person to also employ local labour okay. uh, instead of transporting labour, you know, for a 20 or a 30 kilometres to the site every day and, and, and back. So, uh, I also do believe that, that sometimes the unrest unfortunately are invoked or fueled by people with a personal agenda. And uh, I, I don't have all the facts, okay. it will probably still emerge, but I am concerned that in this case there may be somebody behind this fueling their unrest, spreading perhaps rumors, you know, rumors which then uh, easily you know, got everybody excited. Okay. Again, I want to say, I think that tragedy of this all is it is just a symptom of how desperate people are for economic opportunities in, in this country. Okay. And that is where I believe that the Democratic Alliance with its free market stance is far more uh, suited to economic growth, etc. than what we're currently seeing. Okay. And uh, on a lighter note, we've, uh, we've noticed um, Quite a quite a big thing, I think, for especially for the young folk around Stellenbosch and, and Varsities is the, the legalization of marijuana. I know it's not one of the questions I did send you, so you don't have to answer. We can always edit it out. But um, what is your opinion on the legalization of marijuana or Dacha as such in, yes. in this country? Yes, yes. I frankly know too little about the full effects of marijuana. What I do know is that it has got some beneficial medicinal properties and that uh, apparently in the distilled form, or the oil, etc., uh, a lot of people have seen a lot of relief from pain and, and other conditions. 
and obviously all those options should be researched and uh, if it can be put to good use, good use yes. I think it should be it should be allowed. obviously in the medical sector and, and the recreational sector is then, it's then, touching the, the, that's right then then there's a the other side and it's the same with tobacco it's the same with liquor etc that it, under certain circumstances it can also be detrimental okay. I don't know what the extent of that is in the, in the, in the case of Dachau but I think it's good that we start asking these questions of people and saying you know there's always this balance between the benefits and the disadvantages be it of tobacco be it of oh. liquor be it of uh, you know, having 24 hour restaurants, uh, cell phone towers in your neighborhood, etc. Yeah. There are benefits, there are some, some risks, and one must weigh up those uh, factors and then take an informed decision. Okay. So I welcome the debate that is currently okay. there, but I, I, I don't think anybody should already be in a position to say that I have the ultimate answer. To on make a, a decision, a call, a, a call on it. Okay. And under what circumstances should be made available? Uh, should be also, again, for example, which is an arbitrary uh, call, should it only be available for people above the age of 18? Yes. Okay. Many people might say, oh, no, you can't have children using it. Yeah. But, you know, why 18? Yeah. Why not 16? Why not 21? You know? Yeah. So there are lots of. A lot of research has Research, a lot, a lot of uh, decisions. And I'm always one for taking informed decisions. Okay. First, do your homework. Present the facts and I make a decision. <laughs> and yes, I love homework. First, do your homework and then come to a conclusion. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us in the Cape Radio studios. Thank you. It's an absolute honor to have you here. Hope to see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting Thank me. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Awesome.